It is my pleasure to welcome you also to uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University and to also introduce tonight's uh, speaker. Kathleen DeChera is the quintessential entrepreneur with heart. She began from, mo from modest beginnings when she started distributing groceries out of the trunk of her car in 1975. And today is the president and CEO of the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. The organization distributes 37 million pounds of groceries a year, ultimately serving 1,500 non-profit non, uh, non programs, including 436 programs served by its partner distribution organizations. Through their combined efforts, they assist 900,000 low-income people throughout the state. During her more than 30 years of service to people in need, her efforts have not gone un unnoticed. DeChero has received numerous awards, including those from three presidents, three New Jersey governors, even one pope. I guess presidents and governors turn over more than popes. For more than from the more than 200 executives of Feeding America members, she was selected as the recipient of the most prestigious John Van Hingle Fellowship Award for her vision and leadership on one of the most innovative and productive food banks in the country. She holds a BS in education from the State University of New York in Oneonta and eight honorary doctorates from colleges and universities in New Jersey and New York. Her accomplishments are many. Her background, fantastic. Her deeds, legendary. It's my honor to ask to come to speak to you tonight, Kathleen DeChara. Kathleen. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, just to see the, the young uh, semi-finalists and finalists, it's really very encouraging and inspiring. Uh, our world really needs you guys, so I'm so glad you're out there with that kind of creativity. I did not start out to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> uh, I had nothing uh, to submit as a proposal. I just wanted to find the people in my area who might be going without food. It was a day at a time. Uh, I was not planning at that point to spend the next 35 plus years of my life dedicated to a cause. But it did happen uh, a day at a time. I'm gonna th show you a little bit where we are now, and then be tracked back through it. Okay. Said that we're now up to 38 um, million pounds. When it was an I, my car could, you know, it could it hold a couple hundred pounds if I really squeezed it in. It was very much when it became a we and other people became part of it, that we were able to grow to 38 million pounds of food and groceries. It also speaks to the need uh, in all of our communities that continues to grow. Right now, uh, we have a fleet of trucks. I have 18 straight trucks, uh, two tractor trailers, and hopefully you've seen some of them on the road. And they have signs on them that say, we're moving to end hunger. 
And uh, after this, I'll tell you a little bit about some of my learnings along the way. One of them was buying a tr an old truck, my first vehicle, after saying to the person selling it, I don't know anything about trucks. Whoa, is that a learning experience? <laughs> it wasn't about the trucks, it's what you don't say. Okay. We have a, a second warehouse right outside Atlantic City. And in um, right now, we're actually, we're just taking down the building and we're operating in a mall. But we also run um, an emergency pantry where we serve individuals directly. Uh, the Atlanta County area, uh, Cumberland County, uh, they're having a really hard down, time down there. The casinos were the only game in town. And they've been laying off people and all the ancillary businesses. So there's quite a few people in need and we're um, trying real hard to meet that need. It's another important thing that we do. We partner with community programs that run after school programs and we provide uh, uh, a meal, a hot meal, uh, every day after school. Uh, at one point, someone said to me, you know, of the various programs the food has, what are the ones that, that you think have the potential to be the most life-changing? And although our core business is distributing the food and groceries, job training and feeding kids, to me, are the ones that are really life-changing. If children don't get the adequate food, they're never going to reach their potential, uh, their potential for growth in both physically and, and mentally. So I think of that as a real important thing that we do. Uh, we're also uh, working with seniors. Uh, and as you say, we're doing uh, 1,500 seniors a month. This is one of our job training programs. If you happen to get the Star Ledger in today's business section, we just uh, we had a wonderful feature. We have started uh, a new job training program. We're training butchers, and it's just great. These will be wonderfully paying jobs for them, but we get all the meat they practice on. <laughs> so that was a, a good deal. Um, we also have a donated school supply program where teachers in schools where 70% or more of the kids are on free and reduced lunches can come in once a semester. Uh, we partner with the Trade Association for Office Max and Staples and have, like I said, over a million dollars in uh, school supplies. We also are doing food stamp outreach which is a very important part thing that, that we're doing right at this point. It can make such a difference in a family's life or uh, in individuals. We're finding particularly uh, that so many seniors that are eligible were just not uh, going ahead and filling out the application. So we're working closely, particularly with the seniors. Okay, this is one of our entrepreneurial projects and I do have to say I I scare the board half to death most of the time because I I do have a number of projects that I always think we, this should be our next one but we were picking up bagels and they were becoming like rocks before we could they were day old we were picking them up so by the time we could get them back to the food bank get them out they were really too hard I really didn't like throwing out all of that food so um, I thought, you know, what can we do? We make bagel crisps out of the stale bagels. And uh, our, we've trademarked a name, Grains for Good. We're selling them in the farmer's market. We had to put the project on hold the last couple of years. The, when the economy got so bad, we really needed to concentrate just on getting food out to people. But we're reactivating this. We submitted our business plan uh, to a competition at Prudential, <coughs> excuse me, for social entrepreneurship. And we won first prize with this. So uh, you may see us yet in your local grocery store. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
We also hold a, a wonderful event right in the food bank. We decided we're not the black tie set, so we have a blue jean ball and, and have lots of fun. It's, it's coming up, I think, April 21st. Uh, uh, if you go to our website, um, and find out more about it, you might want to come. It's, uh, this year is a Western uh, theme and lots of fun planned. Okay. We had 27,000 volunteers last year. We could not do what we do with all the, uh, the help of the volunteers. We're open every day for volunteers, every Saturday, Tuesday evenings, uh, one Sunday a quarter. And we have, I think, about eight now what we call family days, where people can come as a family with, with younger children than we ordinarily would have. OK, that was sort of a little story on <laughs> where we are now. I wanted to talk a little bit about the beginning, uh, the, the journey from the back of my car uh, to 39 million pounds to uh, right now, along with the 27,000 volunteers, we also have a staff between ourselves and the branch in the south of 145 people. Uh, back in the late 80s, every time the food bank grew, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to provide jobs. Jobs particularly for someone who might end up at a soup kitchen or shelter. So at that time, I looked to see who was at the end of the line. Certainly people of color were way overrepresented. But if they were coming out of prison or coming out of drug rehab, nobody wanted to take a chance. And I decided at that point that's exactly who I would hire. Uh, it probably more than a nice thing to do or good thing to do, it was a smart thing to do. I've got a staff that I could match against any staff, warehouse staff or other that's out there. Uh, I have talented, loyal, uh, creative, dedicated, wonderful people that, that work at the food bank. And uh, I'm always hoping that other businesses uh, that would like to learn of our experience of working with people who are coming out of prison or out of drug rehab, uh, how successful it's been. Uh, I have almost a 20 year history of doing that and, and, it, and it works, it really does. When, um, I, after I outgrew my garage, I was working with the Council of Churches in the Archdiocese of Newark, and I approached the Archdiocese of Newark. I, by that point, had organized a network of emergency pantries in Essex County and said, if you will give me space, I will organize, volunteer to organize the other three counties you serve. And, um, the answer is sure. <laughs> so I started at, uh, creating an emergency food pantry for the Archdiocese of Newark and coordinating a network of pantries in Essex County with the Diocese and the Council of Churches. Shortly after that, I began to get calls from food companies who would say, I have a trailer load of food. Can you handle it? Mm, yes. <laughs> I didn't have a warehouse. I, I had shelves uh, in an office space, but of course I said yes. And uh, did distributions in parking lots, having charities come in. And uh, one of the first was we got a trailer load of Mrs. Paul's fish cakes. And uh, every time I did it, it was a learning experience. Uh, the, Mrs. Paul's fish cakes came in 35 pound cases and I managed to pick up one but uh, trying two at a time got a little hard. <laughs> I also over the years learned about forklifts. At that same time, I became aware of a group out in Phoenix, Arizona called Second Harvest that had a system for taking in large donations like the calls I was getting and then getting it back out. And it was called food banking. 
And it was sort of a brand new concept. It was started by a man out in Phoenix who had been going, doing what they call now dumpster diving, getting food out of dumpsters and sharing it with people in need. So I went back to the diocese and said, look, I need some more space. And I want to find, put together something called a food bank. And once I do, I need to separate and form a nonprofit. And I was given the additional space, and I put together uh, a wonderful group of people and started the community food bank. Our first building was in a slaughterhouse, former slaughterhouse in Newark. And now I'm going to divert a little bit and tell you about one of the other calls I got along with, can you take a trailer load of food? Just as we were moving into this former slaughterhouse where we had really, we had no heat that winter at all. And because we didn't have heat, we didn't have water and had to go across the street to a diner uh, to wash our hands, use the bathrooms, whatever. But um, a policeman called me and he said, Mrs. DeChara, I've heard about the good things that you're doing, and I, I want to help you. And see, this bull just jumped off the truck, and I shot him. <laughs> and you can have it. <laughs> I said, Whoa. <laughs> he said, it's down on the ground on Railroad Avenue, and I'll, I'll stay right here while you come down. Mm. Well, we rarely ever got meat. So this was something I was going to figure out how to say yes to. And um, ardent feminist that I sometimes am, I called my husband. <laughs> I said, Anthony, look, I, ha I have a chance to get meat for the food bank. And we never get it. I just need some help picking it up. <laughs> and he said, look, I'm in a meeting right now. Um, so tell me where it is, and I'll send somebody to get it. Well, it's not quite neat yet. It's, from what the man says, it's a 2,200-pound bull, and it's down the ground on Railroad Avenue. My husband's in the eyeglass industry. Uh, <laughs> and um, so the, the, the parts of the conversation went on right then that I never include in this story. But what we decided is that there were a couple things that, that had to be done. I had to find a slaughterhouse that would take the bull because it wasn't going to be enough just to pick him up. And then it was, how do we pick him up? So we divided tasks. And I was to get the slaughter company. And uh, I suggested to my husband that, you know, it was the middle of winter when this was happening. And there had to be some construction companies around that maybe had some equipment that wasn't being used right at that moment. So he said, okay, I'll call some people. <laughs> you can try the slaughterhouses. Well, at that time, there were a couple slaughterhouses in Newark. Unfortunately, that's where the bull originally was headed. But when I called up, the first one, I, I really didn't get past. Well, the bull jumped off the truck, and the policeman shot him. He said I could have him. And boom, <laughs> to, to one who really did talk to me and just said, no, we can't take him in here. It, it could violate uh, our USDA uh, rule and everything could get uh, uh, contaminated. No, no, we can't take it. So after calling a few of them, I called the Summit Food Market. And the food bank started in Summit because that's where I live. And so I called the Summit Food Market and said, look, got a chance to get this bull, but can you tell me a slaughterhouse? And he said, yeah. There's one up in Warren. It's a family-owned one. They have a vet on site. If you can get it up there, uh, they'll, they'll accept it. I'll, I'll call them. But two things. Is it a bull or a steer? Because if it's, um, if it's a bull, they'll want to add steer fat to ground meat, tastier or something. And he said, the other uh, thing is somebody has to cut that bull's throat right away. So I called the policeman. <laughs> and I said, officer, and by then my husband did have someone to pick it up. I said, I have somebody that's, that's going to come and, and pick it up. But while you're waiting, first, could you tell me, is it a bull or is it a steer? He said, I don't know. 
He said, I know it's not a cow, and I'm not looking. I said, okay. <laughs> but no, don't bother looking. But while you're waiting, could you cut his throat? <laughs> and he said, look, I got a gun and a nail file. Not going to help. I said, okay. So uh, I called the, the company that uh, had agreed to pick up the bull. And this will sound like I have just put it in the story, but it actually happened this way. I called this gentleman and uh, said, thank you very much, Mr. Bruno, for agreeing to go down and pick up that bull for me. But while you do, could you send somebody with somebody something to cut his throat? And he said, I don't know what you heard, but I don't do that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but he said, that's okay, let your husband do it. Mm, that wasn't part of the plan. And so um, they went and picked up the bull, and I had to quickly call my husband and say, by the way, they're heading to your business. <laughs> and I was just a little late in the calling, they were already there, and um, I, I kept saying, you got to get someone there who might have a knife. Somebody, you know, cuts deer. They do things like that. Well, there were a couple people that, that had some knives or whatever, and they came out, and the truck driver said, not on my truck. You're not going to do that. He dumped the bull out in front of my husband's business. And uh, as you know, it's middle of winter when this is taking place, and not like this winter we're having now. Anyway, they needed two forklifts changed to string the bull up and, and finally cut its throat. And then it ended up in um, Warren, New Jersey. And, and we got about um, 1,500 pounds of ground meat. And over the years, I've told this story a number of times. I've told it at graduations. I've told it at other events. For a while, I thought, well, I'm not going to say this anymore. But when I thought about this group, um, about the focus on entrepreneurship, I thought this might be an appropriate story here. Because as fun as it is to tell, and every bit of it really did happen, every step along the way, it would have been OK for me to say, I can't do this. And, and yet, I persevered. <laughs> and uh, the other part is, at least after the fact, and I guess some ways partway through, there was a sense of fun taking place. And in all of our enterprises that we do, you have to approach it with a sense of passion. But there has to be room for humor, too. It, it, there's going to be so many times, young people out there and every, everyone else, that you trip and fall during your, your pathway to where, wherever you're going. So, so you need to find the sense of humor. Um, sense of humor about yourself, too, not just situations. And to be able to get back up. And, and keep going. And that um, sometimes almost impossible things really can happen just by saying, yes, OK, let me see how I make that happen. I think my father would have, a, I know, I don't think, I know my father would have been rejected, rejected being called a feminist. <laughs> He was another generation way earlier than that one thought that. But in so many ways, he, he was. Because from the time I was little, my father said to me, Kathleen, you can do anything you set your mind to. Now, he said the same thing to my sister and, and to my brother. But it was always underlying things. You can do something if you set your mind to it. The other part of, of my father's message growing up was when a task or an issue came up, I can't because I don't know how, or I can't 
because it's too hard, were never acceptable excuses with my father. And um, sometimes that was really hard, um, and, but I learned so much from it. My parents owned a small apartment house that we lived in in upstate New York. My father was an engineer. And um, I remember I was maybe 14 or 15 years old, uh, come, came home from school, and my father told me that uh, in one of the apartments where an elderly woman lived, that the toilet had broken. And my father said, you know, I really hoped it was going to last till the weekend uh, so I could fix it. But Kathleen, I can't come home, so get a pencil out. This is what you need to go to the hardware store and get. You're going to have to put in a whole new tank set. If you get stuck, give me a call. <laughs> My sister, who's a couple years older, is uh, I, I'm a pretty good plumber. She's the better electrician. She got a little more of those jobs. Uh, but uh, each one of us um, did take the message of, you can do it, whatever you set your mind to. And um, I'm going to just stop a little bit here. You've heard about wh where, where it began where we've ended up, and if there's any questions that, that you might have. OK, raise your hand, and we'll bring the mic to you. So uh, I look forward to several questions. Questions short so we can get many in. It's not a question. Um, it's, yeah. it's a comment. Anyway, that was. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I had an opportunity to volunteer some time at, at the food bank with the New Jersey Women's Lawyers Association. Your employees are wonderful and they're happy and it's cold in there, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, it's a wonderful place. I felt wonderful just spending some time there. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, My we, we do get a lot of compliments when people come. It's a, it's a very friendly, uh, caring place and the employees really feel they're inviting people into the home. From the person who greeted me, it was, it was just the atmosphere was wonderful. And I love your necklace, by the way. Oh, thank you. That, love that, it. That's a coining glass. My daughter-in-law and my son and daughter-in-law were up in New York and uh, uh, coining glass. So it's glass. Thank you. Hi. I just wanted to say that I'm a, a probation officer, and I've had a lot of, of my offenders who have gone through your culinary school. Um, I've also been working with the halfway house prior to what I do now. They've gone through your culinary school. The food is delicious. They've had great jobs, and they have really done well since they left your program. I thank you for opening up to the offenders, because they do have a hard time in finding jobs. And, and mm -hmm. those who have substance abuse problems, they do have a hard time. And your program is great, and the food is delicious. Um, and I will just uh, reiterate that, you know, every time somebody that has been in prison does something wrong when they come out, it really makes headlines. But I have had the opportunity of being exposed to so many people who have come out of prison and given a chance, turn their whole lives around and make such a wonderful difference. And I won't take the time with the whole story, but uh, one of the, the uh, offenders that I hired a number of years ago came out of Broadway prison after 15 years, everything he owned in a, in a sack. Um, he now has a PhD from Seton Hall. I'm also a volunteer. I've been volunteering hearing for a long time, and it always amazes me how you find a way to help so many different people in so many different ways with the leftover food, you came up with the Culinary Institute, which trains people for jobs, and the, the kids' closet, everything is, it, it just seems so efficient. But my question is, how do you manage as you're growing to sort of keep everything I guess, handled well or under control. How did you handle a growing company? Uh, it, 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 there were stages along the way where I think 
We grew past a couple times our infrastructure of staff, uh, particularly where we had to, say, had to look around and say, wait a minute, everybody here is so overloaded that they don't have time for some of the creative thinking that really is important. And uh, so I take a step back and say, wait a minute, we've got to, to hire some additional people. And I also learned very on, I mentioned the truck I bought for $500 that probably wasn't worth 25 uh, because I said to someone I don't know anything about trucks. I learned to make decisions in areas of my greatest ignorance, and I think that that is something that, that all entrepreneurs ha have to face. You say, how, how do you do that? Because you will have those situations. And what I found was that I was able to identify the people who did know something about something I didn't. And uh, it wasn't somebody I was buying something from. <laughs> but I would reach out and, and get the uh, advice and guidance of, of so many people, and, and that, that really, uh, I think, got me through it. Okay. I mean, what's, what's the biggest challenge uh, the food bank faces going forward? What I'm looking at right now is um, the need has, has really just gotten so far ahead of us. Uh, finding the ways that um, perhaps we're going to be able to help more people with, um, with food. Uh, the government commodities, which were an important part of, of what we distributed, have been shrinking. And um, the last year, uh, bonus commodities are the commodities that are part of the price support system, agricultural support system. And because of the weather uh, in many of the farm areas last year, a lot of crops were destroyed. So there wasn't a surplus. So that meant what we got is less. So that's a really big challenge. How do, how do we help more people um, with perhaps less? And, and I have a number of people talking about that. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. I'm, I'm right in the center. Um, you mentioned the difference between moving from I to we yes. was an important uh, transition. But, and what you're talking about, moving from yourself into building a community. Um, can you elaborate more about that transition and, and what type of community you think you are building? have built. Uh, okay, it, it, it's, it's a journey. We're not ever there. Um, with the um, building my staff, with the number of people who were ex-offenders and addicts in recovery, that wasn't necessarily part of my background. I had to learn to trust and then to have people trust me back. And the pathway to that was building the opportunities for mutual respect. We're a very diverse organization right now. And I tell people that in many ways, that enables us to leap over the mountains. However, it does not ever stop us from tripping over the stones. So when I say being a community is a journey, it's when we pick ourselves back up from tripping over the stones. Um, we, we do a lot of take every opportunity to, to share stories with each other. It's important to me to know the name of every one of the 143 people that work at the food bank. It's important for everyone to know whether it's someone that works in the maintenance department or housekeeping, forklift driver to my office, that um, we're all there as, as part of this community. And we're making a difference. And that seems to be the glue that keeps the community growing. Okay, another? Kathleen, um, technology is yes. so pervasive in our lives today. Have you? Are 
exploring ways that technology might help you, or perhaps are you challenging any high school students to be help solve some of these problems? We, we have some young college students, and I probably should go down a generation to some of the wonderful high school kids, and I probably should admit to every single one of you here, you would know way more about it than I do. Uh, I feel almost technology challenged when I am in the midst of some of these wonderful bright high school students. Um, I do have people that are looking at that. We, um, we, we've partnered with um, UPS to put this special kind of GPS on all of our trucks that is helped with the routing and uh, any number of things. And, um, and we've raised some money. We're just finishing up a capital campaign because we really need to upgrade our technology, our inventory systems and whatever. And I do have some young people working on Facebook and Twitter and tweeting and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> One more question. Hi, my name is Ron West. You do a terrific job. It's wonderful. It's amazing. My question to you is this, from our perspective as individuals in the audience here, do you have any tips, one, two, three tips, what we can do to help out with the hunger side? Yes. You know, individually? I mean, yes, I do, and I have to address that um, uh, many times. Um, there's different entry points that people are, can get involved. Um, right now, uh, with the nice weather coming, if any of you are dreaming or thinking about planting your garden, Put a few more plants in there. Well, how wonderful. You know, to me, one of the greatest ways to raise the nutritional level of those in need, give them, a, a, um, you know, opportunity to have fresh produce. So if you're a gardener, uh, if you call us, we can find one of the emergency pantries located near you. Uh, perhaps at your house of worship, you could organize a food drive. We've got to get people to move past the idea that responding to hunger means getting a turkey for somebody on Thanksgiving. That is a nice thing to do, but hunger is there the Friday after Thanksgiving and the rest of the year. The summer time is particularly hard for us. Hunger doesn't take a vacation, but many of our volunteers and supporters do. If you go to our website, it's www.njfoodbank.org. Um, see a number of opportunities, virtual food drives, and then I have um, a really important challenge. That's look at the issues behind hunger. Look at what may be making some of it systemic. Look at the issues, legislative issues. The farm bill is coming up. SNAP is the name for food stamps now are being proposed drastically cut. There are programs for women and infant children feeding programs that are facing cuts. Get involved in the, the issues. Find out. Um, I, I have my feelings of, of, of what needs to be done legislatively around many of those issues, but I challenge people to find out. Find out more about it, and I, I think any of those areas, you will come to the same conclusion. Hunger does not have to be a, um, a political issue. It, it, it is bipartisan. Uh, we have support in the past from both sides of the aisle, both uh, uh, in our state. Governor Corzine was the first one to authorize funds for food banks to purchase food, and Governor Christie has continued it at the full amount. So. Um, we have had that support. Uh, we want everyone to know is if you have a picture of who out there is, is hungry, please know that it could be somebody that's um, uh, handing you change back at a 7-Eleven, or it could be someone pushing a grocery cart. It, it's our neighbors. It's senior citizens. We all know what the high cost of housing in New Jersey is. And, and that's driving more people. Everybody knows somebody that was laid off. 
you know, we live in such a wonderful country in the United States and, and a wonderful state. We cannot let little children go to bed hungry. We can't have our seniors who work so many years crying because there isn't enough. We can't have the people, the working poor, that are doing everything that someone wants them to do, working not only sometimes one job, but two jobs. Try to get by on $7 an hour, $7.25, and live in New Jersey. It's hard. So find out those, those issues. That would help, too. One more quick question. Um, to your point about raising awareness, yes, and I concur that you've built an amazing um, organization. I was wondering if you offer any on-site tours or informational programs for like Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts of America involved, and I would love to try to get our troop there. Yes, we 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 do. We have a volunteer department. If you, you can go on our website and contact them or call them up, uh, we we have uh, many. Scouting programs. Uh, we also have many houses of worship that have confirmation services or bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, uh, that they get the young people involved too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you.